The following is a transcript of a conversation between Matthias de Stefano, referred to as me, and his higher self, referred to as I am. 26th February 2021, Mars. Me. This past week, on February 18th, 2021, the Perseverance rover sent by the National Space and Aeronautics Administration, NASA, landed on the Red Planet, about 102 million kilometers from Earth, at its farthest moment in the orbit of perihelion around the Sun. The fascination with searching for life on Mars goes beyond knowing about life on that planet, but raises the possibility that humans may ever change the atmosphere of this planet and inhabit this world. Although it always seemed to me an unnecessary waste of money, thinking about populating another world when we still do not even know how to take care of our own seems very daring. I am. For an animal that has evolved to reason, to intelligence, when its mind has become infinite, physical space is too small. And if he can, he finds no limits, he will always look for ways to go further. And something that the intelligent, intellectual human possesses is the lack of common sense. Me. Why? I am. Well, a being with an unlimited mentality does not understand the responsibility of taking care of the limits. An intellectual will always ask, why not? While a limited will say, no, I can't. Me. Ugh, I have a very big conflict here. I am one of those who usually says, why not? And yet many times it seems to me a very selfish thought, which does not evaluate the results of its indifference to the limits. But despite this, we would not have achieved anything we have done if there had not been people asking, why not? There would be no technology, art, cultures, human rights, freedom of expression. We would have lived through no revolution and there would have been no evolution. Without the why not, the first hominid would never have left that forest, and today we would still be like the primates of Africa. But it is precisely the why not, the same claim that has destroyed Africa's forests and brought all primates to the brink of extinction, enslaved other humans and shattered natural resources. I am. It's the big dichotomy, the extremes of contraction and expansion. The human is like a heartbeat of the earth, which beats contracting and dilating, consuming civilizations and expanding new ones. The contraction hurts because pressure is felt, limitation, and it is its constant repression that drives to dilation, to the opposite effect that expands, that releases, liberates in search of new horizons, of finding freedom in all senses outside of pressure and limitations. Both extremes of the polarity of action are inherent to the human. Limiting action is containing, but destructive. Unlimited action is expansive, but devastating. Both concepts come together in the human vision of the need to belong, but also to possess. Me. Where is it born? I am. From the fear of losing one's life, like everything. Before discovering agriculture, nomads did not have this problem because they understood that nothing belonged to them. They could only take what they needed and then go on their way. But when they understood the magic of planting, they became sedentary and saw that they could produce much more without having to worry about day-to-day -day life. They could keep their animals in pens and count their grains and fruits to spend the winter. This created a new sense in the human that changed everything. Me. Which one? I am. Possessing. Possession. Possession comes from the Latin potus, power, and sedere, to sit. That is, who discovers the power of settlement, who sits down and says, over this I have power. The idea of territoriality began to emerge, and so the nomadic idea of the limit is the horizon became the limit is where I grow and raise livestock. They began to own the land, to become owners, masters and lords of what grew on them, and therefore they had to defend it. Me, the struggle for riches, for possessions. I am. The Etruscans called possession like the Indo-Europeans, moris, that is, dwelling, place where one lives, land, home. And the spirit of those fertile lands was known as maris, moaris, this was the god of agriculture, a child, young, vigorous, strong, industrious, who walked through the fields, who fertilized the seeds, who encouraged abundance. 
But of course, production had to be taken care of invaders, thieves, outsiders. Thus, Maris harshly defended the Etruscan territories and crops of Italy, the spirit of the guardian of the strong and powerful young man who tended the vegetation became an emblem for the new peoples of Etruria, sons of Romulus in the seven hills of Lazio, Rome. The Romans, immigrants from the coasts of western Anatolia, exiled from Troy, took their keys to the new land and with their impetus for power began to expand as all their ancestors had done long ago following the legacy of territorial expansion, defending their crops, but this time with a little more ambition, conquer as many crops as possible. The peoples were growing, and with them the need to feed more and more people, to generate more resources and products, which led the Mediterranean peoples to start incessant adventures with the banner of the god of agriculture. Me. The one of agriculture? Did they do everything in the countryside? I am. Absolutely. Thus, Maris became Romanized, becoming Martius, known today as Mars. Me. The god of Roman war was the god of agriculture. I would never have thought that. I am. It's all about the food. But the ancients were not fools, and their war campaigns were never made during the cold winter, because it was useless to fight with the cold, with scarcity of food. Invading territories without active workers was not a good option. So they established certain rules of struggle. All would be carried out from spring, with the first sowings, so they could at least conquer fields in production to feed the soldiers. Because of this, the first month of the year was named in honor of the god of agriculture and sowing, who soon also became the god of battles and war to defend the fields. Me. The Champ de Mars, in the month of March. Does March rise from Mars? I am. Martius, it's Mars time, just like the second day of the week, Martes, all in honor of this god. The Norse called Mars as Tyr, which is why in English you know the second day of the week as Tuesday, the day of Tyr, but they kept the nomenclature of the month in relation to Rome. Me, March, the first month of the year? I am. January and February are added months for the Romans and Greeks, who had ten months on their calendar. March dedicated to Mars, Martius, the initiator of sowing. April dedicated to Aphrodite, Apru, Afro, the spring beauty. June to the goddess Juno, wife of Jupiter, divinity of youth and marriage, union. From here the months were called in order from the beginning of the year. Quintilis, fifth month, July. Sextilis, sixth month, August. Septembris, seventh month, Octobris, eighth month, Novembris, ninth month, and Decembris, tenth month. Although Quintilis was renamed by Julius Caesar, whom Augustus Caesar was not far behind, changing it to his name as divinity in the Sextilis, so we have July and August. Me. Wow, interesting. And January and February? I am. Two months added after taking the solar calendar of Egypt and Mesopotamia, where the days of celebration of annual change were rearranged. January is in honor of the god of time, Janus, who has two faces, one looking to the past and one to the future, talking about the end and beginning of the year. And February comes from the period of purification, a time when one renewed oneself to begin the new cycle in March, from the Latin februa, atonement, purification. And in cycle, it starts again on Mars. This planet, then, is related to Aries, the initiating sign, the beginning, the force, the will, the inertia and spark that begins all things. Me. And the one who can start a fire and burn everything. I am. The wrath of the fire, the rage, the anger. For this reason, the Greeks called this god as Aries, from the word Are, which means misfortune. Unlike the Romans, the Greeks saw this god as the one who encompassed all misfortunes, conflicts, battles, wars that broke into the harmony of daily life, that which destroyed everything in its path. Hated by the rest of the gods and humans, Ares did not hesitate to show his discontent with the world by running over everything in his path. Me. 
and the planet encompassed this concept. Why did they call it Mars? I am. At first glance, you can understand why. If you look at it in the sky, you will see that its color is not like other stars, whitish, but reddish. The red color of his light made him imagine himself bathed in blood, and therefore he was characterized as Ares, dipped in the blood of his enemies, or Mars, advancing through the territories, seizing them. Thus, humans granted this world the power of the god of war. Mars is reddish due to its high concentration of iron oxide on the surface, which corrodes everything by turning it red, rusty. The planet, although approximately three times smaller than the Earth, has certain peculiarities, and they are that it has the highest mountain or volcano in the solar system, called Mount Olympus, in honor of the home of the Greek gods, which is three times higher than Mount Everest, with a base of 600 kilometers wide. That is, a volcano as big as all of Germany. It also has the largest and deepest canyon in the solar system, with wide areas of between 200 to 700 kilometers, a maximum depth of 11 kilometers, and 4,500 kilometers long, as well as from east coast to west coast of the United States. And besides, it has a particular aspect that resembles the Earth. It has water. Frozen at its two poles, but its geography is fraught with valleys and dry rivers. They indicate that it was once a planet full of rivers and seas, and perhaps life. Me. Martians? I am. Well, not green, that's for sure. Maybe reddish. Redhead. Me. Is it true that people from Mars once came to live on Earth, and that redheads are a memory of it? I am. No. Me. Just like that? Well... I had to try. I am. The stories of men or warriors come from Mars and women and muses come from Venus are nothing more than a legend of Greek mythological interpretation. That beings from other worlds have come to this one is true, but it does not mean that humans have decorated their visits with their own stories and tales. Me. I understand. I am. What matters to us about Mars is its action. This planet represents the will in our subconscious, and as we saw, it describes the expansion. As we have seen, the human seeks to expand by nature, seeks to extend his possessions, and thus relates possessions with work. And if he doesn't work, he invades, and if he doesn't have enough power, he steals, he cheats. The pursuit of possession is related to having, controlling. But all these concepts are not born of the force of possessing, but of the fear of losing. Mars describes the biological body, an organism designed for battle, against hunger, against sleep, against viruses and bacteria, against the pressure of the world, against extinction. The body was designed as an armor of being, prepared for the great battle of life, and the way to survive is to accumulate reserves, is to feed, having what to face life, having energy to go through the worst moments. The first battle is to live, the second is to breathe, the third is to eat, the fourth is to sleep, the fifth is to reproduce, the sixth battle is to transcend. For the body, everything is based on the struggle for survival. Action, then, is the key to achieving this. And the action says, before the world consumes me, I must consume the world. Thus, there is an inner force in every living being that leads it to leave where it finds itself with the need to expand, to gain territory, to conquer. The Martian expansion of spring, pollinate, reproduce. As you will see, for nature, this struggle is normal, balanced, lives in harmony with the rest of things, for it is based on the foundations of matter, which is limited in its quantity, unlimited in its transformation. But then the intellect comes, and the limitation of matter seems to it a prison. Where the body sees opportunities for subsistence, the mind sees nothing but limitations of existence. And it creates stories, legends, dreams, which it manages to capture through the materials on the ground, but falls short. You need more. He uses culture, thought, 
art as forms of battle and interprets others as bacteria. Thus are born wars, invasions, empires, genocides. Spilled blood is the mind's need to satisfy its unlimited need in a limited world. Me. That's why we get angry. That's why there is rage, anger. It's all the energy that our mind generates looking to have what it cannot, which not only goes beyond objects, but also people, emotions, souls. We get angry with others because we cannot get from them what we expect, and we can never get it from others because it lives in the idyllic of our unlimited mind. This frustrates. I am, and it makes you angry. We fight for our discontents, because things do not go as we expect them, because it is never enough. Sound familiar? Me. Yes, it sounds familiar. But it is difficult not to get angry. That is, how do you control in yourself that almost biological need to want to possess, for everything to go as expected? I understand what you're saying, but in many people that way of being is almost a program. I am. This attitude transcends when you manage to clear the two satellites of Mars. Me. Phobos and Deimos? I am. They are two asteroids, rocks, that have their orbit around Mars, but their names have enormous symbolism in this fight. In 1877, astronomer Hall saw these two satellites circling the red planet and aptly named them Fear, Phobos, and Panic, Deimos. Fear and Panic are the satellites of every human's mind, like flies that haunt him, reminding him that he can lose the battle. Your mental, emotional, or physical wars are at risk all the time, and these rocks flutter your smart head, making you doubt your limitless ability. Thus, the intellectual becomes cold, controlling, manipulative, forgetting the present, and seeking to cling to the future, controlling the impossible, losing the notion of the possible. Fear consumes the action of Mars and turns it into reaction. Panic consumes the will of Mars and turns it into violence. No one is bad or aggressive by nature. All violence and aggression, reaction and impulse come from a fear, from the panic of losing control, falling into the jaws of limitation. Every violent, aggressive warrior being is nothing more than a soul that fears losing what it achieved. Me. Getting angry, then, is synonymous with fear. Aggression is nothing but accumulated panic. Sometimes I get angry about many things. I get angry about many injustices, or I get very angry with certain people. It makes me angry when people comment without asking, when they prop up without listening. It makes me very angry that people who work in consciousness consider themselves superior or give lectures to others from moral superiority. It makes me very angry when, instead of doing their process, they want to control mine or give me advice that I have not asked for. It makes me angry at times to see that this same thing happens on a planetary level as judgment. So much injustice. So much separation. I despair seeing that consciousness is an almost lost battle when I see people's reaction to the slightest. When millions are spent on going to Mars, when on Earth no balance has been found, when companies and politicians fight for their interests, when citizens blame systems for their own irresponsibility, when they judge the way of life of others according to their own conceptions of life, when banalities are discussed while others die of hunger. This world of polarities is a world of dualities which have become opposites in struggle, in war, creating cracks between equal humans only because of an overwhelming need to dominate, control, overcome others, to be right. I am. Inspire. And remember what Pluto said. You're going to die. No matter what you do, you will die all the same. There is only one possible way out. You are in a limited world, and your body has an end, as does your reason and intelligence. Fighting to control the uncontrollable does nothing but awaken Phobos and Deimos in you, there are born the evils of Mars in humanity. But remember, Mars is not war, it is agriculture. Resignify this world. Inspire. Put the seed. Be patient as it takes root. Water it with the waters of your soul, with the inspiration of your spirit. Sing to it as it grows. 
Read to it and tell it about the wonder of life as it blossoms. Its fruits, then, will be eternal and will nourish each seed beyond your death, and your voice, your soul, and your spirit will live in each one who consumes the fruits. Patience and constant action is the attribute of procreation, of generation. Humanity has been in the great struggle for thousands of years because instead of seeing the fertile ground of Mars, they look with fear at Phobos and Deimos, feeling in the rich iron the blood of the struggle to survive. Me. Transcend fear and panic and you will see the real Mars. I am. That of the will. That of the beginning. That of force. That of sowing. You will see how the iron-rich soil strengthens the plants that grow, creating forests and jungles. It re-signifies the battle to live. Because life is already eternal, you just have to free yourself from the idea that life must be eternal as you want. Let go of what you wish to possess and you will see that the only eternal thing is transformation. Me. The only permanent thing is change. Heraclitus. I am. That's where true infinity lies. That's where action finds its eternity. When you let go of the control over the life you have, you will become eternal in existence. Me. I awaken in myself the will of Mars, and I decide to start a new path where fear and panic are only memories of my past that guided me to survival. I am. I am action, and in it I find freedom. Me. I am will, and there I find eternal life.